It was almost midnight on the 2nd of September 2010 when a distraught boyfriend placed a panicked call to 911. He had just heard gunshots from inside the house. Breaking down a locked door and forcing his way to his girlfriend's side, where she lies shot on the floor, he pleaded with emergency responders to please hurry. Get someone here now. He was a deputy with the local sheriff's office. He was one of them. Deputy Banks of the Sheriff's Office. I work with y'all. Your friends are on their way, the deputy was told. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. At JTL, we deliver serious coverage of the cases that really make you think. If that sounds like your type of true crime, then you've come to the right place. Today's case is a complicated one, and it doesn't follow any of the regular patterns that we're accustomed to seeing. In the years since this horrific incident took place, the case has involved one state attorney, multiple special prosecutors, internal investigations, four medical examiners, and many theories of what actually took place. Let's take a look. Before we dive into the details and the controversy surrounding this case, I'd like to take a moment to offer a thank you to the sponsor of this video. When I partnered with MyHeritage, they kindly sent me one of their DNA kits to discover my origins and to maybe even find relatives living all over the world that I didn't know I had. Taking the test was very straightforward. The results will give me an ethnicity estimate, a percentage breakdown of my origins across 42 supported ethnicities and over 2,000 geographic regions. After I sent off my test for analysis, I took advantage of the MyHeritage photo features to enhance and colorize some of my old family photos. The color really brings it to life. All right, I've given it some time and now my DNA results have come into my email. I know that all of my grandparents were born in Scotland, so I am anticipating at least some of my DNA linking me to the British Isles where I now live. But beyond that, I have no idea what to expect. Let's take a look. Kevin is 67% Scottish, okay. Good amount. 22% English, okay, that is not shocking. 8% East European. And what do I round off with? 3% Baltic. Okay, that is a very white person. So that was really fun. Also really informative. Thanks for being here with me for the reveal. If you're interested in exploring your ancestry, MyHeritage has a promotion running right now. Click the link in the description box and use the coupon code shown here and in the description of this video for free shipping. Now, let's get back to the video. In September 2010, 24-year-old Michelle O'Connell lived with her boyfriend Jeremy Banks in St. Augustine, Florida. The historic city sits on the Atlantic coast in the northeastern region of the state. It's part of St. John's County. The county sheriff is one of the region's largest employers. This is where Michelle's brother Scott O'Connell, working as a sheriff's deputy, met fellow deputy Jeremy Banks. A year after introducing Deputy Banks to Michelle, the couple were living together in Jeremy's house along with Michelle's four-year-old daughter, Alexis. Michelle was very athletic and fun-loving. Back in 2010, Michelle was a young mother known to be outgoing and adventurous. This side of Michelle's personality was balanced by her unfailing dedication to her daughter. For years, Michelle worked two or even three jobs at a time to make ends meet and to properly support little Lexi, who was the center of her world. On September 2nd that year, Michelle had plans with boyfriend Jeremy and her brother Scott to attend a concert at the St. Augustine Amphitheater. She dropped Lexi at her sister's and the group spent the evening having fun and enjoying the music. Or at least most of the group did. Jeremy was in a foul mood, which would only worsen throughout the night. 
Shortly after the couple returned to the house after the concert, things took an extreme turn. It was 11.20 p.m. when Jeremy placed a call to 911. Please get something to my house. It's for sure. Please, 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 my girlfriend. I think she just shot her. Ma'am, ma'am, I need you to calm down. Ma'am, it's sir. It's sir. Listen, hang on. Let me tell you the truth. I'm Deputy Banks of the Chicago County Sheriff's Office. I I work with y'all. Get someone here now. When Deputy Jeremy Banks's colleagues from the Sheriff's Department responded to his house, they found the door open. Through the kitchen and into the adjoining room, Michelle was found on the floor. To her left was the gun, Jeremy's service weapon. It had been removed from its retention holster and the tactical light was left on. One bullet had struck on the floor, just below Michelle's right arm. Two shell casings were located in the corner of the room. Photos of Michelle and the home were taken rapidly to document the state of the scene prior to paramedics rushing in and trying everything they could to assist Michelle. It was, however, too late for medical intervention. Michelle was declared dead at the scene. The first responders into the house reported smelling alcohol on Jeremy's breath. In these first moments, colleagues recalled that the boyfriend did not appear sad to them. Jeremy was angry. Michelle's purse was quickly spotted on the kitchen counter. In an effort to formally ID her, officers checked through her bag. Inside, they spotted two prescription pill bottles, both for antidepressants, and both in the name of Jeremy Banks. Some of these pills were also found in the front pocket of Michelle's jeans. For several hours, the deputy remained at the house speaking with colleagues. His first interview took place in the back of one of the cruisers while still at the scene. This is Detective Himes. It is officially September 3rd at 1.23 in the morning. You were outside in the yard driveway? I was, my motorcycle was in the garage. I was sitting on it. And, uh, I heard it pop and I knew exactly what it was. And I ran inside. I started screaming her name. The bedroom door was locked and I screamed her name again. I heard it go off again for the second time. I ran into the living room. I grabbed the, the phone and I kicked the bedroom door in and I found her laying where she is. Okay. Jeremy explained that he and Michelle had been arguing earlier that night. She planned to leave him. Just whenever she said, I'll have my stuff out by this weekend, and I said, are we breaking up? She said, yes. I was like, all right. I raised my voice. She raised her voice. We argued. But we got to the house. We were fine. After a few hours, as word spread, more and more of the sheriff's team, both on- and off-duty officers, began arriving at the scene. As they consoled Jeremy, they also came to a unanimous conclusion. Jeremy was telling the truth. The autopsy was performed by the county's medical examiner, Dr. Frederick Hoban. The doctor found that some alcohol but no drugs were found in Michelle's system, in spite of the pills located in her pocket and handbag. Michelle had died from a gunshot to the mouth. Dr. Hoban also identified a small cut and bruise above Michelle's right eyelid. He determined that this injury was made by the ejected shell casing when it discharged from the weapon. He found no indication of defensive wounds. Gunshot residue was found on Michelle's hands. A forensically insignificant amount was found on Jeremy's hand as well. This small amount was attributed to him rushing into the room after hearing the second shot. Based on these findings, the doctor supported the conclusion already broadly accepted by law enforcement. Dr. Hoban ruled the death a suicide. Jeremy Banks was brought into the police station for a follow-up interview 12 days following Michelle's death. This discussion did not follow the typical pattern of a police interrogation. <laughs> At some point prior to this interview, Jeremy had gained access to the sheriff's report on the incident. I already read the report. I know I probably shouldn't have. I just wanted to know what, what was done. I was towards the end, we're arguing all the time. 
What was it about? Just, just stupid. Just that's how it was. It was an argument over stupid, petty. Okay. That echoes in this room. Yeah. I don't yeah. really like that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah great room. In these initial days and weeks, Jeremy Banks seemed to be the only person close to Michelle that believed his story made sense. To the O'Connells, his version of events was ludicrous. It was conceded that in her teenage years, Michelle had battled with both depression and anger issues. However, it had been years without her experiencing a reoccurrence of these issues. Since having Alexis four years earlier, Michelle had become a motivated, dedicated, and proud mother she would not leave her daughter. Michelle had also just received a promotion at the daycare where she worked full time. The role came with better pay and benefits. She was set to begin the new role that week and she was excited for the new start. And that was not the only sign that something wasn't quite right with Deputy Jeremy's story. At lunch on the day of her death, Michelle told one of her sisters, Christine, of her plans to break up with Jeremy that evening. This news came as no surprise. The women in her family knew that she was being mistreated in her relationship. Christine asked her to skip the concert that night, but Michelle was holding her ground. She had purchased the tickets, so she was going. Text messages exchanged between Michelle and Christine, as well as her brother Scott, foreshadowed that something was coming, but interpretations varied. Beginning at the amphitheater and continuing into the night, Michelle sent texts to her sister seeking promises that her daughter would always be taken care of. Promise me one thing, Lexi will be happy and always have a good life, she wrote. That no matter what, Lexi will always be safe and loved. What's going on? I'm scared, Christine texted. By the end of the concert, Michelle texted her sister, I'll be there soon. The last text she sent that night was to her brother, Lexi, never forget. Several weeks after Michelle's death, the O'Connell siblings, Sean, Jennifer, Christine, and Deputy Scott, met with Lieutenant Bradley from the St. John's County Sheriff's Office for an update on the investigation. They were told that the case was being closed. Hopefully this will give you some closure as to, to what occurred that night. All indications are that she was contemplating suicide based on on her text. I asked the night that Michelle died, I said, am I allowed to submit a statement because she told me a lot of things about, and I'm just going to spell it out for anyone to hear, domestic violence. Mm -hmm. She came to my house, she said, I'm leaving, I'm scared. Am I allowed to submit an affidavit just to testify to what she said? And he said, no, none of that is, it's all here. So if this I was the sheriff's daughter, it'd be much different. Will your lieutenant of this agency stand up and answer our questions? He's up front. You know, I'm doing the very best I can, guys, to, to show y'all what happened. And I feel like this is a damn imposition on me. It's not against you. I haven't you. done anything wrong, guys. I, I, Sheriff's I, office has a good. <laughs> and I can, I can feel at this table that there is a massive conspiracy theory. And there is not one, guys. Can I interject? What conspiracy theory are you talking about? Right. That Jeremy right. is the murderer of Michelle. Okay, I keep, I keep getting that. And I've been getting that over the last you know, several weeks. So what we need to do, guys, is we need to, we need to sit down and we need to just, this is what it is, but I mean, and this is what happened. And, you know. In the weeks following, Scott O'Connell was fired from his role as a sheriff's deputy. His distress over the lack of action taken in his sister's case had led to angry outbursts at work, so he was dismissed. His mother, Patty, continued to work as a file clerk at the sheriff's office for a time but described the work environment as unbearable, knowing that her daughter had been murdered and her family's pleas for justice were falling on deaf ears. By 2010, St. John's County Sheriff David Shore had been elected to his position three times. Two of these times, he ran unopposed. The sheriff was both a popular and powerful figure in the county. Eventually, following roughly four months of public pressure, he agreed to have Michelle's case handed over for an independent inquiry. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement, the FDLE, sent Agent Rusty Rogers to St. Augustine to reinvestigate Michelle's death, and the agent hit the ground running. He set out to fill in the gaps left in the sheriff's investigation. With no witnesses or a suicide note, 
the family should have been interviewed to determine Michelle's state of mind. Agent Rogers began those interviews. It, it felt like to us, as a family, that it was rushed. They had their mind made up this was suicide and that the investigation could have went a different way and, and that he knew there were things in the past that he had done that she was going to report and that it was going to come out that his this deputy sheriff was not the true person that he was playing to be and that he was actually a pretty bad person to her. From interviewing family and friends, Agent Rogers learned of Michelle's recent promotion, that she had CPR training scheduled in two days' time, that she had plans to meet another friend, Mindy, that night, and had even popped out to the garage to retrieve her handbag in order to fix up her makeup. The neighborhood had not been canvassed for witnesses by the sheriff's team. Within two weeks of commencing his investigation, Agent Rogers located not just one, but two key witnesses. Two women, each in their respective homes on nearby streets, overheard an argument taking place in the direction of Jeremy's house on the night of September 2nd. Both witnesses reported clearly hearing cries for help, followed by two gunshots. Um, we heard a woman yell for help, and then we heard a gunshot, and then there was another yell for help, and then another gunshot. This evidence was considered to be so significant, a potential turning point in the case, that the witnesses were administered polygraph tests from the Secret Service to determine their credibility. They both passed. It was obvious that Jeremy Banks had not been treated like a standard murder suspect. He had not been properly interviewed, nor had he been thoroughly processed. Drops of blood on the inside of the t-shirt that he was wearing that night returned a match to Michelle. It also appeared to be a different t-shirt than the one he wore earlier to the concert. Jeremy offered no explanation as to how this blood could have gotten there, nor was he pressured by the original detectives to offer one. Other DNA evidence was also suspicious. The gun was found to have traces of Michelle's DNA, but it did not contain any traces of Jeremy's, nor any of his fingerprints, despite it being his service weapon and carried by him earlier that day. There was also no blood found on the gun, though spatter was visible in the area surrounding it. Curiously, the pill bottles found in Michelle's purse did not have her DNA on them. Then there was the issue of the second bullet. To recreate a scenario that would explain the crime scene as it was found, Agent Rogers enlisted a veteran crime scene reconstructionist and former police officer, an expert named Jerry Finley. Mr. Finley's final report raised more doubt about the sheriff's conclusions. He questioned whether Michelle O'Connell would even have been capable of removing her boyfriend's service weapon from its retention holster, which is designed to prevent unauthorized persons from accessing the gun. Similarly, the tactical light required two movements to activate. Would Michelle have known how to do this? Perhaps more impactful than these speculations, however, were the tests that the expert performed to determine the likely position of the shooter based on the location of the shell casings. Finley fired the gun 18 times in different positions and concluded that for the shells to end up where they had, in the corner of the room behind and to the left of the body, whoever pulled the trigger had to have been left-handed. The only left-handed person in the house was Jeremy Banks. Finally, in direct contradiction to the conclusion of the medical examiner, Dr. Hoban, Finley found that the cut to Michelle's eye could not have been caused by an ejected casing. He believed that it was a separate injury. Perhaps she had been struck with the gun as part of a struggle. After this new evidence came to light, Dr. Hoban revisited his determination, and he changed his mind. The medical examiner altered his findings from suicide to shot by another. For a time, it looked like a formal homicide investigation may actually take place. As part of Agent Rogers' inquiry, he spoke with the officers who had responded to Jeremy Banks' home on September 2nd. What he learned was that even the responders who seemingly knew that something was wrong with Jeremy's story came to accept it. When I first walked into that room, the first thought that went through my mind was, this is not good for Jeremy. 
Did you think it went down like Jeremy said it did that night? Um, I don't think so. I mean, just I was a little uneasy where the I remember seeing the uh, shot in the floor and where the gun was. I mean, I was in the homicide unit for a few years and it didn't add up, but I didn't do more investigation into this to see why things were like the work. She had pulled the gun out of a secured holster and shot herself. That seems strange to you? Yes. Expl Back. Explain why. Um, it's a retention holster. Uh, most people don't know how to use them. Um, Did you ever know him to have an explosive temper? Oh, yes. Yeah, he's had he's had temper issues. Um, you know, his temper was what uncontrolled. What time did he live with you? He'd drink and he'd just get pissed. You know, he'd throw around and just throw a fit. I didn't have any suspicions that it was anything other than suicide. It, I think that's what we were all kind of discussing, uh, but just making sure that we covered our bases. Following Agent Rogers' report, the FDLE handed over the results to the state attorney. The prosecutor recused his office from the case, citing its close relationship to the sheriff's team. At this stage, a special prosecutor was called in from a nearby district to review the FDLE's evidence. This prosecutor, Brad King, relied on the reports of three medical examiners. All had concluded it was a suicide. Two additional experts had been called in to consult after Dr. Hoban's assessment. Seeing himself in the minority opinion, Dr. Hoban then again changed his mind. It was a suicide after all. All three doctors stated that the key to this determination was that no defensive wounds were found on Michelle. There's one obvious flaw in the examiner's logic and that was the bruise and cut on Michelle's eyelid. For their conclusions to be correct, it had to be caused by the shot itself. The new chief medical examiner, Dr. Predrag Bulik, was one of the three doctors who offered their opinion to the special prosecutor, and he had a theory. Michelle held the gun with her left non-dominant hand and upside down. Down in her mouth, upside down, and you find that hard to believe. Not just that, it would have been with her left hand. The shooter was apparently left-handed. Everyone agrees on that. The only left-handed person in the house that night was Jeremy Banks. Michelle was right-handed. Dr. Bulick posited that when the gun fired, the tactical light caused the mark on the upper part of Michelle's eyelid. In order for the shot to have caused the impact, the gun needed to recoil in a forward motion, which experts stated was a physical impossibility. Guns recoil backwards. The upside down gun theory was endorsed by the special prosecutor, who concluded that there was not enough evidence to recategorize Michelle's death as a homicide. While Brad King conducted his review, Sheriff Shore was busy muddying the waters even further. Unimpressed with the unfavorable results of Agent Rusty Rogers' inquiry, the sheriff responded with a report of his own a scathing 152 pages that accused Agent Rogers of manufacturing evidence, coaching witnesses, and lying to obtain search warrants. The sheriff's report forced an internal review of Rogers, who was placed on administrative leave while yet another internal investigation was undertaken. Some of the complaints lodged about the FDLE agent were found to be valid, but hardly the levels of corruption that the sheriff had suggested. Rogers had searched Jeremy Banks' cell phone without a warrant, believing that an existing wiretap on the line and warrant to search the house was sufficient to cover the phone as well. It was not. He also referenced text messages in his report that were not properly documented, such as the one sent from Michelle to her sister just before her death, stating that she was on her way to collect Lexi. Michelle's phone data was never properly collected. Only notes in the case existed to record these exchanges. Agent Rogers was reprimanded and given additional supervision. Uh, Agent Rogers was used as a scapegoat to show people if you don't look the other way, you will be punished, you'll lose your job, we'll put you through the ringer. Over the years, the case attracted the attention of amateur sleuths and independent investigators, as well as professional reporters. 
The New York Times published an investigative deep dive that had initially sought to uncover how sheriff offices dealt with domestic violence accusations against their own officers. This led them to St. John's County, and then to the case of Michelle O'Connell. One independent investigator had made multiple record requests of the sheriff's office and was taking a fresh look at the evidence. 38-year-old Ellie Washtock, whose birth name was Craig, had been conducting private research on the case for over a year and was in regular contact with Patty O'Connell. On the 31st of January, 2019, at roughly 7.30 a.m., Ellie's teenage son returned to their condo from a neighboring unit and made a horrifying discovery. Okay, what's going on there? Um, got shot. Okay, what makes you think that? He's currently laying on the floor. Do you see, see a weapon there, sir? Yes, there is a weapon. It was his own gun? Yes, it was. Ellie had sent his son to spend the night at another unit in the building because apparently he thought something terrible was going to happen. It's unclear what exactly prompted this intuition, but the next morning, he was dead from a gunshot to the head. There is a lot of gunfire. He was shot more than once. I don't know, but there are shots going through the wall. Both Patty O'Connell, as well as Ellie's father, believe that the amateur investigator's murder was connected to his interest in Michelle's case. I think uh, if he wasn't in looking into that or if he wasn't involved with that or whatever, yeah, I think he'd still be alive. That, that's my gut feeling. What I heard was that he put Chandler in a downstairs apartment two floors down because he was afraid of what was going to happen or something was going to happen and he didn't want him getting hurt. Due to the conflict of interest, the murder investigation of Ellie Washtock was handed over to the Putnam County Sheriff's Office. There have been no arrests made and the authorities have named no suspects. But the police noted that Ellie was likely to have known his attacker because there were no signs of forced entry and it would have been difficult for a stranger to get past the security gate at the Laterra condominiums, which sits in a gated community. For this reason, and perhaps others that have not been disclosed, Putnam County detectives do not believe that Ellie's death is connected to that of Michelle O'Connell. In a bid to have Michelle's cause of death revised and the case reopened, the O'Connells agreed to have an independent pathologist re-examine her body. Dr. William Anderson undertook this task pro bono. Michelle's remains were exhumed and a second autopsy performed. The results revealed clear evidence missing from Dr. Hoban's report from years earlier. Michelle's jaw had been broken. I discovered the fracture only basically on the second autopsy. So all of those people that were making an assumption this was a suicide were unaware of the existence of the fractured mandible. And that's a different injury pattern, and it creates a whole different scenario in the case. We have external trauma. We have significant trauma unrelated to the wound itself. And that means that someone else was involved. At the end of Dr. Anderson's report, the conclusion plainly states, the manner of death should be considered homicide. Deputy Scott O'Connell was rehired by the St. John's Sheriff's Office. After approximately three years, Scott accepted Sheriff Shore's narrative. He blamed Agent Rusty Rogers for formulating an inaccurate account of his sister's death and convincing the family that she was murdered, when in fact, he now believes that was not the case. The sheriff made the announcement of his return at an employee convention in the summer of 2013. He also chose that platform to celebrate Jeremy Banks, who he viewed as a victim a deputy who had suffered years of unfounded accusations. There may be some of you in this room who have doubts about this case. I don't know, man. I think it was a homicide. Jeremy Banks had nothing to do with that case. This guy right here came so damn close to being charged with homicide based on nothing. Let's give these two guys a hand. In 2019, Jeremy remained a deputy with the county. 
Through an attorney, he told a media outlet that Michelle's death had ruined his life because neighbors walk up and down the street at two at night and will scream at him, murderer. The Justice for Michelle O'Connell Facebook page remains active. David Shore served four terms as sheriff, a total of 16 years. In early 2023, he became the head of investigations at a sizable law firm with offices across Florida and Texas. After a three-year probe, Agent Rusty Rogers was cleared of wrongdoing and reinstated as a special agent with the FDLE. Alexis O'Connell has grown up with family. The O'Connells continue to hold out hope that justice will be served for Michelle. And that was the strange case of Michelle O'Connell. Thanks for watching. I'm Kevin. This is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.